hospital from, and I will ping people to answer them. But I will check the office hour that you mentioned to see uh, how we can follow up quickly. Thanks a lot. Are we live? So I assume I'm audible in Zoom and YouTube, and hopefully in, in lecture. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, let's get us started. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to another lecture of Computer Architecture. Today we're gonna discuss about interconnects, which is one of the fundamental issue that we need. Um, when we are designing multiprocessors or multi-core. Actually, I would say that we need the concept of interconnects even for, I mean, for every chip, let's say, because we'll see uh, briefly in the lecture that uh, one of the signals that we need to interconnect it well is actually clock. So clock signals need to be interconnected well. And there are also some way to interconnect that there are different topologies. So essentially, we are uh, dealing with the concept of interconnects in, I would say, every digital system. So we, we already discussed about multiprocessors. I mean, some fundamental things about multiprocessors and asymmetric multicore design, as well as memory ordering and cache coherence in the previous lectures. Uh, it's just uh, to jog your memory. We have these uh, two cache coherence methods, Snoopy bus and directory that we discussed last week. So in both of them, actually, uh, interconnection network uh, plays a, an uh, important role. So in, in a Snoopy cache, uh, we are actually relying on a, a bus interconnection network, which is the point of synchronization. Even though we can also try to design a virtual bus um, or totally order interconnect such that you can um, basically make sure that everyone sees uh, the, your interconnection network as a broadcast uh, point of view. But uh, b basically, uh, it's very hard to design that. And for directory also, we need an interconnection network uh, such that cores can uh, communicate to the directory, uh, basically, instances. So interconnection network is an important part of Snoopy cache protocol, directory protocol, and basically, and we're gonna learn about it today. So interconnection networks, uh, these are the required uh, readings for this uh, lecture and uh, on some, as well as some recommended materials. So let's uh, start with some basics. Basically, uh, the first question that we want to answer is that where is uh, interconnect used? So basically interconnect is used to connect and communicate between components. And there are many examples for that. You can also think of. So processors and processors. So in your system, when different cores they want to communicate, we can use, we should use interconnect. And in some uh, systems, we need to communicate between processors um, and memory banks. So we need interconnect for that. Connect communication between processors and cache banks we also need interconnect. Also, sometimes we have this non-uniform cache access, NUCA, that cache uh, and caches, they are communicated. Uh, so we need interconnect for that, or also IO devices. So basically we need interconnect almost everywhere. And, uh, and basically, uh, but in different uh, component of the system that we design this interconnection network, we have different trade-offs and different uh, access pattern so there are many, many important uh, detailed things that we need to uh, consider to optimize interconnection network for that special component that we're gonna also uh, learn about them uh, today. So basically, as I said, interconnects enable communication. It could be some switching network that connect uh, processors to the storage uh, modules, or can be, for example, some nodes that we have processor and storage, and uh, the, these nodes are, for example, connected to each other. Uh, details of this uh, figure is not that important. It's just about uh, some real uh, interconnection network design that has been used in this uh, the cosmic cube uh, in the past. But basically, the goal of interconnection network is to enable communication between storage, 
components in this work between processors and between different uh, processing elements, uh, considering processor and storage domain together. So why interconnection network is important? So it affects the scalability and cost of the system. So how large of a system can you build? So imagine that you want to include, uh, let's say, integrate 16 cores uh, in your device, in your chip. So probably inter bus interconnection network can handle that. But the moment that you, for example, you want to add like integrate like 64 or thousand of cores in your chip, then you will re realize that bus interconnection network is actually a bottleneck. So basically uh, the concept interconnection network affects the scalability and cost of your system because there are some interconnection network that they are quite fast. Uh, but but they have a lot of uh, cost uh, to build them. And we, we will also uh, see today. So basically how large of a system can you build or how easily can you add more processors? So when you can imagine the bus interconnection network, if you want to add another node to your bus, it's just making bus a bit larger and add another node to that. It has some scalability issue, but uh, conceptually, it's easy to add another node to your uh, bus architecture. But there are some interconnection network that they have a specific uh, topology, and it's not uh, very easy actually to, uh, to basically uh, conceptually add another node. So sometimes when you want to add another node, you actually you need to add many, many uh, redundant nodes, uh, which they are not used. For example, if you have, for example, uh, interconnection connecting 16 cores, and now you want to go from that topology that connects 16 cores to 32 cores, for example, uh, sorry, uh, from 16 cores to, let's say, uh, 17 cores, I mean, adding another core, you will realize that, for example, that topology cannot provide perfect uh, interconnection network for 17 cores. So you need to actually have, for example, 32 cores. So you are wasting some resources here, basically. And that's uh, exactly one of the reasons that this topic is why it's quite important. An interconnection network affects performance and energy efficiency of the system. Basically, how fast can processor caches and memory co communicate? So the performance of interconnection network is quite important. How long are the latencies to memory? Uh, again, because of the uh, performance, I mean, what's the latency of your memory, uh, sorry, interconnection network? And, and also what is the throughput of your interconnection network or what's the bandwidth of that? Because at some point uh, your interconnection network uh, cannot provide very, I mean, uh, let's say reasonable latency because the load is too high and uh, your performance significantly drops. And how much energy is, is, is spent on communication? So ideally we want to have zero communication energy, but uh, at the end of the day, this is interconnection network that also move data internally, and it consumes uh, a lot of power consumption. And depending on the system, there are many, many reports uh, basically targeting the, uh, the contribution of interconnection network power consumption in uh, total system power. And th there are different reports from different baselines. But overall, I would say that something between a uh, few percentage, like 5% to 20, 25 percentage can be the contribution of interconnection network power consumption. And also interconnection network affects reliability and security of the system. So th this is one question, for example, can you guarantee messages are delivered or your uh, protocol works? So interconnection network essentially is about to provide a medium such that cores can communicate or ca uh, cores to cache can communicate. And there could be sometimes that we have some faulty nodes or faulty links that uh, we cannot we cannot basically uh, we we cannot approach uh, the node that we are looking. So some interconnection networks they have some fault tolerant uh, techniques such that you can actually find another pass from the source to the destination. So you have better reliability. Or for example, in the security domain, uh, in even though different cores they may actually work on different applications. Interconnection network is a shared domain. So they are actually putting their data on the shared domain and uh, there could be also some security attack uh, like performance attack or also leaking information. So we can also uh, leak some information from uh, attacker can do that. 
because interconnection network is a point of uh, synchronization, or let's say it's a shared domain that everyone used it. So there are many parameters and goals uh, to design a network. And actually, uh, I would say that we need a semester course to cover actually interconnection network. The topic is so broad and dense, uh, but unfortunately we don't have time. And I'm going to give you a, high, a very high uh, picture of this uh, uh, interconnection network only today in one lecture. We may also premiere some more lectures about that, but that's it. But basically, if you want to learn more about interconnection network, this is a very nice book that I would suggest that you um, basically take a look. This is like principles and practices of interconnection network from uh, Dali and Tovas. This actually has a lot of uh, high level interesting uh, concepts of interconnection network, as well as some detailed concept, like how we should actually architect routers um, in, in the interconnection network. So I really uh, encourage everyone to check this book. So as I said in the beginning of this lecture, it's not only about interconnecting uh, cores and caches or memory and cores or memories and sending data. Another example is also a clock distribution network. So the problem is that in clock, sig clock signals, uh, they arrive non-uniformly uh, non -uniformly late to different parts of a chip. So some, um, some part of chip, they receive clock edge earlier than other. So we have this clock skew issue. And uh, as a result of this clock skew, we need to make sure that we have a uh, long latency. I mean, the, the, the clock frequency should be, uh, we should lower the clock frequency um, considering the effect of clock skew issue basically. So the solution is that we uh, design the interconnect to equalize the arrival time of the clock signal to all parts of a chip. So that's why interconnecting clock is very important. So this specialized interconnect communicates the clock signal. This is a very common way of uh, interconnecting clock, which we call it H3. But yeah, essentially, uh, in, there are also other ways of uh, interconnecting clock uh, signals, but I'm not going into that. So this is actually to uh, handle this clock skew issue. So clock skew effectively increases both uh, setup time and hold time of your uh, uh, sequential circuits and increase sequencing overhead basically. So which means that we have less uh, useful work done by per cycle. So designers might keep clock skew to a minimal and that requires intelligent clock network across a chip. And this H3 is, is an example, but there are also many other uh, ways of doing that. And this is an example of uh, basically clock skew in, uh, in, a, in a real chip, alpha uh, 21264. And you can see that there are, uh, depending on the position of you in the chip, like the vertical axis and horizontal axis, you will see the different skew. So different parts of the chip, they are observing different uh, frequency, and that's that's an issue. If you want to learn more about this clock skew timing and verification, I would uh, encourage you to check this lecture in DDCA course that uh, Professor Mutlu covered it in detail. Okay, now let's uh, continue our basic interconnection network. So there are three, let's say, important uh, topics, uh, overall topics in interconnection network. And the first one is topology. Second one is routing algorithm. And the third one is buffering and flow control. So topology is, specifies the way switches are wired or routers are wired, basically, the, the, which has analogy of to graph theory, the way that you connect, uh, basically, different nodes in the, in the network. So it affects routing, uh, reliability, throughput, latency, and also building ease of your interconnection network. So there are some routing algorithms that they are specified uh, to, sim to some specific topology. So you cannot apply the different, I mean, one routing algorithm on all uh, sorts of topologies. And as I said, reliability is also quite important. There are some interconnection network that they don't have good reliability. Um, imagine, consider a bus, let's say. So there is only, one communication fabric across different cores. And if your bus is faulty, essentially uh, 
old cores cannot communicate. Or there are also some other uh, communication, uh, let's say topology like array that you connect uh, different cores in array mode. And then, uh, so if, if one of these link is faulty and you actually, you, you cannot communicate anymore. So some nodes are unreachable to some other nodes. So basically the topology and the, the past, uh, let's say the path diversity that we have in our network and the, the amount of number of links, they actually affect reliability of your topology. Throughput latency, we will uh, see also more. And building ease is also another important uh, um, metric for topology. So routing algorithm is uh, defined as how does a message get from source to the destination? So that uh, defines by the routing algorithm. It could be static or adaptive. We will see in this lecture what they mean, but very uh, at a very high level. Are you uh, changing your routing algorithm or let's say you are the path from the source to the destination depending on the uh, status of the network or so sometimes some links are busy or congested so an intelligent routing algorithm can actually bypass those links can find another path such that we don't pass through those uh, congested part of the network so those routing algorithms are they call we call them as adaptive routing algorithm but there are some routing algorithms that they are static so basically they don't change the the path depending on the uh, the, the characteristics of the network. And buffering and flow control is also another important topic, which is uh, what do we store within the routers uh, or and links? And entire packets, parts of packets, etc. Basically, how you uh, move your packet or data from one switch to another switch, it defines, uh, it's defined by buffering and flow control, basically. We're gonna basically uh, go into all these topics in this lecture. And, and how do we throttle during oversubscription? Sometimes uh, your, your network is overloaded and your latency is quite high. So flow control can actually try to, uh, can throttle uh, injection rate to that network such that you don't uh, lose uh, data. Yeah, and again, uh, buffering and flow control is also tightly coupled with routing strategy. Even though these three topics are uh, different, I mean, they are kind of uh, disjoint, but they also have some, uh, you know, uh, common things, and they they affect each other. So, as I said, routing algorithm is dependent on the on the topology as well. For example, okay. So I'm gonna give you some uh, terminology in this top in this area. Uh, might be a bit boring, but this is uh, what we need to understand this uh, lecture. So the first terminology is a net network interface. Uh, basically the module that connects endpoints like processors to network. So basically the idea is that we want to decouple the processor or cache or anything like that to the network. So there is a network that has uh, switches or routers and there is a network inter interface that each uh, node in the in should communicate through that network interface in order to enter uh, data or packet to the network. So we, we have this network interface in interconnection network. Another terminology is link, which is a bundle of wires that carry a signal. Uh, switch or router uh, basically connects fixed number of input channels to fixed number of output channels. That's the definition of switch or router. The uh, routers are usually more intelligent compared to switches. Switches are relatively smaller and simpler. Another uh, terminology is channel, which is more or less similar to link. Link actually consider, we, when we talk about link, we actually, uh, we are, uh, we, we consider the number of wires that we have, the frequency of the link. If the link is the, basically, yeah, as I said, yeah, the frequency of the links and the, the, the bandwidth of the link. So it's actually hardware terminology. But channel is uh, in, in interconnection network is actually considering, it's considered the um, basically very high level. So when you talk about the topology, you count the number of channels and you don't really care about the width of each channel. So basically channels is, as I said, a single logical connection between routers and uh, switches. So it's a bit at a, at a high level definition. So node uh, in the network is actually a router or switch within a network. 
uh, message is unit of transfer for networks clients. So imagine that a processor wants to uh, send a, a message like four kilobytes of data to another processor. So we call it a message. And the packet is actually unit of transfer for network. So sometimes your message can consist of several packets. So the, the network interface has to uh, basically send, communicate the message in, uh, within several packets. And the fleet is actually the, uh, defined by flow control digit, which is unit of flow control within network. So some flow control, they, they for example, uh, transfer, uh, even though your packet can be like several, uh, let's say cache block, let's say several uh, 64 bytes, uh, each fleet can be, for example, 64 bytes, which meaning that link uh, width is 64 bytes and you communicate uh, your, you transfer your packet from one node to another node, fleet by fleet, basically. So again, fleet is also uh, uh, considered as a hardware terminology, kind of. So it depends on the on the implementation of your design. Any question? Okay. So some more terminology. Uh, another one is uh, direct or indirect networks. So. It de it's actually depends on defined by the term, by the topology of your this, uh, network. So endpoints uh, sit inside, or we call it direct, or outside, or in the indirect the network. So basically, uh, this is the picture of kind of indirect uh, network. That these are the endpoints, like the source, and these are the destination nodes. Nodes, and we have several switches in the in between. And they, these switches are communicating, basically transferring packets, messages from source to the destination. So this is a, an example for, let's say, indirect uh, communicate network. And this is an example for direct network that basically each uh, node, each node, each, uh, let's say, endpoint, or like the processor or cache has a switch or let's say a router. And then uh, basically, end nodes or processor or caches, they are actually inside the network. So we call it as a direct uh, network. Any question? Okay, now let's uh, take a look at some basically uh, terminology related to topology because we want to focus more now on topology. Another uh, one uh, basically way to uh, categorize different topology is actually uh, considering as a regular or irregular topology. Essentially regular uh, topology, if uh, those topo topology that they, they have a regular graph, like a ring or mesh or truss, we're gonna see. But there are some uh, basically topology that when you look at the graph, they, they are, the graph is not that regular. Uh, so it, regular or irregular network, it's important to distinguish between them because for, for regular networks, uh, we can build them usually easier because it's just uh, you know repeating a pattern and, uh, and coming up with the routing algorithm for them is also easier. But sometimes irregular uh, networks, they actually, uh, we uh, basically prefer them. We would prefer irregular networks because they are more efficient. So if, you, if there are some nodes that they have to communicate a lot, you can actually have a, a different topology for them. And those nodes that they are not communicating, you can have a less, uh, let's say, connected uh, uh, topology for them. So you can actually make a regular network uh, for them, like asymmetry, again, design that we also uh, discussed. Uh, routing uh, distance, which is the number of links or hops along the road. So whenever you there is a road or pass from a source to the destination, uh, the number of links and hops that uh, the packet uh, needs to take in order to uh, reach the destination is actually called as routing distance, and it's actually defined. Uh, it depended on the on the on the topology. So some uh, by changing the topology, you can reduce or increase uh, this routing distance. The ometer is actually the maximum routing distance within the network. So among all the routing distances that you have from every source and destination or every pair of source and destination, uh, the maximum of that is actually the diameter of your network. 
An average distance is average number of hops across all valid uh, routes. So, so here you need to make a, I mean, average, you need to calculate all the, uh, the distance for every pair of source and destination, and then basically calculating the average of that, which is uh, the average distance of the network. Any question? Okay. So another important uh, metric, which is uh, important for this, uh, the performance of interconnection network is actually bisection bandwidths. So bisection bandwidth is, uh, is one of the, let's say uh, one of the metric to show how, perf uh, how high performance is the network. And usually the way that people can calculate is that they, uh, they half the network and then they calculate the number of wires that goes through these uh, two uh, sub network. So essentially it shows that if I want to go from one uh, part of the network to another part of the network, uh, how many links do, we, do I have? Or for example, in, in a country, imagine you're in a city, you want to go from north of the city to the south of city, how many uh, street or highway I have, you know, from the north to the south. So if you uh, cut the, 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 the road plan of that city, you can calculate the number of um, basically streets and uh, uh, highways. And that essentially shows that how, how much, uh, how efficiently you can make a global uh, communication from one uh, side of the network to another side of the network. So that's the way that we uh, calculate the bisection manners and why it is important. But sometimes it's actually misleading because it does not account for switch and routing efficiency and uh, certainly not execution time. So Basically, not all of the time you are, your uh, communication uh, pattern is actually global. So most of the time, actually, many communication is, coming, uh, is uh, happening neighboring. So you, you are communicating to your neighbor nodes most of the time, or let's say for a majority of your uh, execution time. So not all actually communication is coming from uh, basically global communication. And at the same time, uh, there are some works that they also show that the number of links that you have from uh, one side of the network to another side is not that important. Uh, we should also consider the width of those links. So because uh, so the amount of wires that or metals that we can put in a, in a chip, uh, we can roll from one side to another side. The number of metal wires, they are that's actually uh, that's not infinity, right? So we have limited number of wires. So the way that uh, we um, distribute these uh, metal wires to different number of links uh, can affect the performance. So there is actually a beautiful paper that shows that even though there are some topologies that they have very high bisection bandwidths, when we consider, when we take into account the limitation of uh, metal wires, uh, the amount of uh, wires that we can have on chip, we're gonna see that uh, some other topologies with less bisection bandwidths, they, they are better basically. So, Basically, this is a very old metric that people have uh, have been used a lot uh, to uh, to categorize or rank different topology. Another uh, metric is actually uh, blocking versus non-blocking. So some uh, topologies are blocking, meaning that uh, when when there is a communication in the network happening, so from one source to another destination. Uh, and, I, and another source wants to communicate to another destination, this communication, the second communication cannot happen because it has some conflict with the, with the ongoing communication. So that topology, for example, our example topology is blocking topology. But if connecting any uh, permutation of sources and destination is possible, network is non-blocking. Uh, so which is actually very good to have non-blocking network, but it's also very costly. So most of the time, our networks are, they are considered as blocking networks, but uh, we should try to, to not uh, basically push the network in the, in the worst case of that. So on average, they are actually non-blocking, but in some worst case scenarios, they can be also blocking. Um, so the, the, the network that we usually design. There is also another topic, which is rearrangeable non-blocking. So it's actually trying to uh, make a non-blocking topology with reasonable cost. So the way that switches are connected, it can be 
uh, actually adaptive and change. So uh, on the runtime, uh, we can actually connect uh, switches differently uh, to, to in essentially to make uh, different, uh, to allow um, different source of communication in the network. Any question? Too many terminology, terminologies? Yeah, it's always like that in the beginning of interconnection. Yes, can, can you use the mic? I would like to ask a question about the bisection bandwidth. Uh, does it determine how we, uh, we split in half or is it the same across? Every every different iteration. So for for every topology, you need to actually come up with a way uh, to calculate bisection bandwidth. So the definition, the it has actually very exact definition in graph theory. Um, so I don't want to go into that. But for example, for a uh, for a mesh topology which we have the, here, this is a mesh topology, for example. You know, for this one is quite easy, right? So you can, for example, consider this line to have this network and then you can calculate the number of links connected or you can uh, put the link that have for, uh, vertically right so for actually for every topology there is a uh, section that we need to understand how we can um, partition that network into two halves and calculate the bisection bandwidth sometimes it's not actually so obvious okay there are many different topologies in the literature. Uh, here is some examples. So the simplest one is BOSS. And the next one is point-to-point -point connection, uh, which is the most costly, uh, let's say, topology. Uh, crossbar, uh, ring, tree, omega, hypercube, mesh, tross, butterfly, star, and many, many more so that we don't have. But if you, if you search for that, there are tons of papers, actually, that people uh, develop different interconnection network topology, and they uh, basically characterize it, show the different metrics for that. The, this topic was quite actually uh, hot when people were uh, looking at interconnection network only, uh, because we are less, uh, let's say, constrained by the cost when we are thinking of interconnection network. But when this topic actually comes into on-chip network, like interconnection that we have on, on the chip, so in on chip you are limited by the resources. So the the the, the, top, the topic of uh, looking into different topologies and devising new topologies is actually uh, now less uh, hot. But it was actually quite hot in the past. So we're gonna uh, basically very briefly learn about these topologies, some of them at least uh, in this lecture. So there are some metrics to evaluate interconnect topology, like the cost. Uh, of, so we can consider the, we, we should have define a metric for the cost. So it could be the number of wires in your uh, topology, or let's say the number of channels. Uh, for latency also we can have a metric. So we can consider latency as the number of hops, which is uh, basically how many hops I need to take to reach from a source to the destination. But you can also consider as the average distance of the network, or you can consider sometimes you want to uh, minimize the diameter of your network. Sometimes you're okay to have higher uh, diameter, but you have better, or let's say lower average uh, distance. So basically, uh, there are many, many uh, metrics to define latency. And uh, another important metric is actually contention. How uh, well your interconnection topology can handle contention. Basically, how many uh, different uh, paths we have from one source to the destination. Because when you have a, when you have a rich uh, path diversity, you can actually uh, distribute the load better. So you, you you don't need to you don't have to use only a single a single a single path from every source to the destination. You can actually change your paths. So. Bus is the worst one, basically, right? Because you have only one pass for, for every communication. But there are also many other uh, metric exist, uh, like energy, bandwidth, overall system performance, which uh, basically they are also important uh, once we are designing uh, topology. So this is a, the picture of bus interconnection network. In this example, for example, we have eight nodes, and they are connected to the bus. So 
basically all nodes connected to a single link in the terminology of uh, interconnection network. So it could be also different. So nodes can be different. They can be processor cache and other nodes can be memory. You can think of any kind of communication. Actually, in uh, you, you guys have already learned about solid state drives, right? SSDs. So it could be also a bus that connects a flash controller or SSD controller to flash chips, basically. So that's also another uh, bus architecture that has been used. So good thing for bus is that it's quite simple and it's cost effective for a small number of nodes. That's quite important. Even though when you want to increase nodes, you, you just need to basically uh, just uh, end links bus and add another node. But uh, essentially, at some point, the, the, your bus is getting too large or too long, and the RC delay of the bus is getting uh, so high. And then uh, your bus cannot uh, operate on relatively good frequency, and you need to significantly lower down the frequency uh, in order to make sure that you, your data is, uh, can communicate it correctly. And again, a bus is easy to implement uh, for cache coherence, like the snooping and a serialization, because it's actually a point of uh, synchronization. So everyone sees the bus. And it's very easy uh, to implement a Snoopy cache coherence protocol. But uh, unfortunately, bus is not scalable to large number of nodes, and it has limited bandwidth. And also electrical uh, loading, as I said, uh, it reduce, uh, reduces frequency. And, uh, and bus has high contention. So it means that the network has been, is going to be saturated soon. So fast saturation. Uh, we, we, we learn about saturation also at uh, the end of this lecture. But very simply, saturation is a, is a point that basically your network cannot tolerate uh, more uh, throughput, basically. So the amount, so you inject uh, uh, packets or messages at one certain rate but your network does not deliver those messages in that certain rate. So it actually delivers them in much lower rate. So you, you are uh, observing this saturation point. But basically bus does not have uh, has diversity, so it has a lot of contention. So it's gonna saturate soon. Any question? Okay. Another uh, extreme way of uh, communication is actually point-to-point -point communication. So every node connected to every other with direct or isolated links. Here, for example, node zero is connected to all other nodes. Now node one needs to also connect it to all other nodes. Node two, node three, and then at some point we have this network. So basically it has the lowest contention for sure, but uh, potentially lowest Latency, why potentially? The two. Exactly. So if, if you, yeah, if you consider that, yeah, we have a separate link for everything. I mean, we are, we have low latency, but in the, uh, at the end of the day, when you want to, uh, build this interconnection network on a real chip, you actually need to make some links much uh, longer. And then those links actually, they have higher latency. So might not actually provide uh, the best or the lowest latency as well, at least for some of uh, some communication. For some, those uh, uh, nodes that they are connected with a short link, they have, we have high uh, performance or low latency, but for some other uh, nodes, the wire links is, uh, comes to play. So could be considered as ideal uh, network, but if cost is no issue, which is always the issue. <laughs> so the cost of a uh, point-to-point -point connection is high. So we have uh, O N connections ports per node. So every node has, if we have N nodes in the network, the degree of each node is N or N minus uh, one, but so, here we are talking about the order of that. So order is order of uh, order of n, and the number of links is actually in order of n square basically, and it shows that it has high cost, and essentially it's not scalable.
So another uh, simple and let's say well-known topology is a crossbar. So every node uh, connected to every other with a shared link for each destination. So it enables uh, concurrent transfers to non-conflicting destinations. So as long as your destinations are different, you can actually make, uh, let's say, eight uh, parallel transfers, right? So the, the topology is kind of non-blocking, can be considered non-blocking topology, as long as your destinations are different. So that's a good thing for bus, and actually it could be cost effective for a small number of nodes. So it actually is a good, let's say, trade-off uh, between uh, between bus and the point-to-point -point connection. More or less, is actually a, a good topology and has been used a lot in in, in real devices to connect processor to cache banks um, and uh, something like that. Yeah. So it has low latency and high throughput, but still it's expensive. Uh, could be not considered not a scalable topology uh, depending on the number of nodes. So it's order of n uh, square cost. And we have this difficulty to arbitrate as n increases. So now that we have a bus, we have a bus that connects uh, all the inputs, zero to seven, to one destination, right? So whenever one of them wants to come, uh, put data on that bus, there should be an arbitration for basically for this channel such that who can put the data uh, on, the, on the channel. So the, the fact that we need arbitration is, uh, could, can make it actually difficult. We need also arbitration when we have boss. So arbitration is uh, something that whenever you have a boss or whenever you have a channel that different, uh, different inputs can load data to that channel, we need an arbitration basically. But, uh, I mean, despite all these uh, difficulties in uh, crossbar, it actually actually has been used in core to cash bank networks. For example, in IBM Power 5 or in Sun Nigra 1 and 2. So this is another uh, way of designing crossbar. So we have a kind of a tri-state buffer that uh, by controlling the enable signal of this uh, buffer, you can uh, decide which input can should connect to the output basically. So in Sun, uh, we we has uh, they people have been ha, people have used uh, this crossbar network to connect uh, cores to different banks. So they have this high bandwidth interface between eight cores and eight uh, L2 banks and this NCU. Um, and for a stage pipeline for basically uh, request handling, arbitration, selection, and transmission, basically. And they have also this uh, two deep queue for each requester to hold data transfer requests. We can actually add some uh, buffer or queue to, uh, to, the, to this uh, bus, uh, to each channel. And that queue can actually hold uh, some of the uh, data. And it's, it basically reduces the, the effect of arbitration. Now that you have a queue, uh, different cores can put data in that queue and basically the bus will, or the channel of this uh, crossbar will service uh, each of these requests one by one. This is also a more detailed picture of this uh, Sun chip. But yeah, so it can be bufferless or buffered crossbar. This is a picture of bufferless crossbar that basically uh, we need arbitration and then uh, these nodes can put data on the bus. But there could be also some uh, buffers that we have. And essentially this, this buffer can uh, buffer uh, data and then put uh, data on the bus one by one, basically. So it uh, simplified the arbitration and scheduling. And uh, it can also provide efficient support for variable size packets. But again, it requires n square buffer. So it comes at a price of more buffers. So now the question is that can we get lower cost than a crossbar, but yet still have low contention compared to a bus? Any idea? Uh, have the lower triangle of the of the mesh, 
of the crossbar. So you can connect to any network, but you don't need the upper. Yeah, basically, uh, we don't need to connect to the destination node by one hop. So that's a way to reduce the cost. So you can actually increase the number of hops that you need to take from source to the destination. Because if you check the check all these uh, prior uh, basic topology that we already discussed, for example, this crossbar, the number of hops that takes from node three uh, to connect, for example, to node two is actually one, right? It's just put the data on this uh, channel and then, and then this bus, and basically the, uh, the output node will read the data. Or also the number of hops for bus is also one, assuming that you, you, you may need to wait because of the buffer control or arbitration phase, you may not be successful in arbitration requests. But the moment that you you can you uh, the bus uh, basically the moment that you get uh, granted uh, to access the bus, then the latency is one hop. Or for example, for point to point connection is one hop again. So the way that we can uh, reduce the cost is actually uh, increasing the number of hops. That's the that's the way. And the idea is to use multi-stage networks. This is an example of multi-stage network, uh, Omega. So the idea is that indirect networks uh, with multiple layers of switches between terminal and your nodes. So the cost of this network is actually N log N. Uh, and the lat latency here, the number of hope is uh, O uh, order of log N, basically. So there are many variations of that, like Omega, Butterfly, and other also. Uh, indirect networks, but you don't need to memorize uh, these networks and how uh, nodes are connected. But I just want to give you the idea of that, that by this uh, multi-stage network, you can significantly reduce the cost, but it comes at the price of a higher number of hops from the source to the destination. So for example, here, if uh, node uh, seven wants to communicate to node seven, we can have this uh, link or pass. And one uh, now consider that node one wants to con communicate to the node uh, number six. So this is the pass, basically. That's the only pass that this topology provides for us. And now you can see that we have a conflict here. So this topology, for example, is not, uh, not non-blocking. It's actually blocking. There are some multi-stage network that they are actually non-blocking, like a closed network. It's actually a very uh, complicated network. But yeah, uh, if you're interested, you can actually learn about them. Uh, but it's, it's important to get the idea of that to me. So again, a multi-stage network, uh, basically it, res uh, it uh, usually restricts the number of concurrent uh, source and destination pairs uh, compared to crossbar, but it is less costly than a crossbar. Like the, as we said, for example, the, the cost of a butterfly network is O n log n. So this network can be implemented as a circuit switch. We're gonna uh, learn about circuit switch and packet, packet switching also today. But essentially in circuit switching, a uh, source destination path completely set up so all switches, uh, they need to be configured um, before we initiate the communication. So, so once uh, node, for example, zero wants to connect to node six, we need to, config, to pre-configure all the switches that we have in the past such that node zero can communicate to node six. That's essentially circuit switch, um, uh, basically uh, communication or... Uh, we, we call these a switching, circuit switching or packet switching. We call them a switching method. So the, the good thing for them is that there is no need for buffering since switching is a static uh, once pass is set up. So, once you, so basically, once you set up your pass, uh, your communication from source to destination is actually uh, is not, uh, cannot be interrupted. So you don't need to buffer your data because other one, other, there is another uh, flow that wants to uh, share your bandwidth. Basically in circuit switching, we don't have that. We have this uh, dedicated path from source to the destination. So we're gonna also learn about the trade-off between circuit switching and packet switching. I don't want to go into detail of that for now. And then another way of that is actually packet switching. 
So this multi-stage network can be packet switch. So packets uh, basically hop from router to router and it's pending av uh, availability of the next require switch and buffer. So basically you need to add buffers now, uh, more or less. There are also some ways to implement packet switching without buffers, but conceptually you need some buffers and uh, and those buffers because as because you are you are going from uh, node by node or switch by switch hop by hop right and your next hop might not be available so you need to wait somewhere and that buffer essentially uh, makes it possible for you to wait for the packet to wait there any question so Basically, a trade-off between circuit versus packet switching. Circuit switching sets up full pass before transmission. So establish a route, then send data. Uh, none else uh, can use those links while circuit is set. In packet switching, uh, we route each packet individually and possibly via different paths. If link is free, any packet can use it. So circuit switching, we have faster arbitration. I mean, once we are, uh, when, once we start sending our data, we don't need actually arbitration anymore. And we don't need, we don't need uh, buffering. Even though people are also buffer, uh, they, they, we have some small registers uh, when we are using circuit switching because the long combinational pass from source to the destination is actually is not good because you need to significantly reduce your frequency in order to make a connection from source to the destination. So from at each hop or several hops, you need to buffer. You need to add registers, basically, such you make sure that the combinational pass is not that long. But yeah, conceptually, you don't need buffer. And uh, setting up and bringing down pass takes time. This is the downside of circuit switching. So usually circuit switching are good, uh, is good for those uh, packets or those scenario that uh, once you establish a, a pass or a circuit to the, from the source to the destination, then you want to send a lot of data. So imagine that uh, you have some huge messages like let's say a few megabytes in the network. So it's okay to spend some time to establish the pass and you can amortize the overhead of that by sending a few megabyte, megabyte of data uh, in the network, interconnection network. But, but if your messages are frequent and small, then uh, probably circuit switching is not that good because you need to uh, frequently set up the pass, bringing down the pass, and that has a lot of overhead. We actually uh, published a paper uh, in ISCA uh, 2023 that we uh, showed that how circuit switching can be used actually in order to uh, significantly uh, improve the performance of interconnection network in solid state drives. Uh, we're gonna cover that paper in next week. Uh, we call that paper Venice. So, even now, also circuit switching is quite useful, uh, depending on the case, basically. So this is also another, uh, let's say, obvious limitation of circuit switching. Pass cannot be used by multiple flows concurrently. So if you reserve a pass and you don't utilize that pass, then that's bad, because that reserve pass can be used for other flows, basically. But Basically, packet switching uh, doesn't have the downside of circuit switching, but uh, it's potentially slower, uh, must dynamically switch. So basically, uh, when in, in packet switching at every hop, you need to make some decision, which output link I should take, or uh, you need to attend, uh, you need to deal with arbitration phase of uh, at each router because, uh, because nothing is reserved and every shared channel or shared link uh, can be used or can be accessed by several different packets. So there should be some arbitration at every hop and decision-making basically. So you need to spend time every hop. So it could be, uh, can be potentially slower, but when you think, uh, consider the, basically the latency you need to spend to set up a pass for circuit switching Sometimes packet switching is faster. So in the end, it's a trade-off again uh, between packet switching and circuit switching in terms of performance. 
So in uh, packet switching, uh, we need to handle contention via buffering. Uh, I mean, it could be also without buffering, like bufferless network that we will also briefly see today. But basically, you need, you need to somehow handle contention in the network. And that needs uh, some work uh, and makes router complicated, basically. But for sure, the good thing is that we don't have setup and we don't need to bring down time. So pass is not established. And uh, you, you don't need to wait to set up a pass. And after that, you don't need to wait to bring down the pass such that links are completely free for other uses. And it's also more flexible and does not underutilize links. Any question? Okay. So switching versus topology. Uh, these are basically switching, circuit switching, packet switching. So circuit or packet switching choice, uh, they are actually independent of topology. So it is a higher level protocol on how a message gets sent to a destination. But, but actually there are some topologies that they are basically more uh, amenable to circuit versus packet switching. So in the end, uh, your topology can affect your choice for circuit uh, for your switching technique. But uh, conceptually, these switching and topology, they are different concepts. We have uh, actually seen the, this slide in uh, one of our lectures, uh, I guess in asymmetric multicore. So this is a, a, the heterogeneous interconnect that has been used in Tyler. So basically, as I said, uh, like we have different uh, choices for topology, for example. We have different choices for uh, switching. So in the end, uh, you don't have to select one of them. And it makes sense also to combine them and intelligently use them in a, in a heterogeneous manner. So this is, a, for example, an example that uh, has been used in uh, Tyler processor. So the topology was fixed, like 2D mesh, but there were uh, five networks in, that, uh, in, the, in this topology. And four of them was uh, basically a packet switch. One of them was a circuit switch. So, and you can see, for example, for this uh, circuit switch has been used for streaming data. So once uh, you want to stream a lot of data, it makes sense to make a basically spend time to set up a pass and then such that you can stream a lot of data. So that's exactly show the trade-off between circuit switching and packet switching. So there are many, many different multi-stage networks. I don't want to go into detail of them. This is, for example, is Delta network uh, that connects uh, basically eight uh, nodes with the uh, destination. So uh, again, this is a single pass from source to destination, and it proposed to replace costly crossbar as a processor memory interconnect. If you're interested, you can actually check the paper in ISCA 1979. Uh, this is also another network, Omega. As I said, you don't need to uh, memorize the way that we connect uh, nodes in this topology. To me, the, the, the idea of using them is also why we are using multi-stage network is important. So, but one, one uh, important, important uh, let's say interesting topic here is that uh, we can also do some computation in the network. So like the concept of processing memory, once your data is communicated from source to destination, why not also doing some computation on that data? So that idea has actually has been, uh, visited or has been uh, proposed in this work. And they actually, they combine multiple operations on a shared memory location. Like the uh, in Omega network switches, they combine fetch and add operation in uh, NYU uh, ultra computer. So yeah, basically uh, fetch and add MI, so return M, but replace M with M plus I. So it receives a, basically M and I, and then combine them and return M plus I. So network can actually do that. And you know that by doing that, you can also make this systolic array, for example, right? Systolic array also is very similar to that. Um, Butterfly is another uh, famous multi-stage network. It's very equivalent to Omega network, but it's also indirect and using uh, BNN Butterfly. 
conflicts can cause uh, tree saturation. So butterfly uh, network is actually, is not uh, blocking, is actually, uh, sorry, is not non-blocking, is actually blocking. So you cannot uh, establish many parallel paths together, parallel flow together. So now uh, let's uh, quickly review different topology that we have seen so far. Like this is a crossbar topology. This is a one multi-stage logarithmic topology. And this is, for example, mesh topology. Uh, we know that crossbar is indirect. Multi-stage network is also indirect. Mesh is direct. Uh, crossbar is actually non-blocking. Uh, multi-stage network is blocking. And mesh is also blocking. Cost, uh, this is O n squared. Uh, in multi-stage network, is cost, the number of links is actually O n log n. No, I'm sorry, number of uh, switches is actually O n log n. And in mesh is actually uh, order of n, the number of switches. And n, n is actually the number of processors that you, or the number of nodes that you have in your network. So the good thing for crossbar is that latency is O of one, it's just one, a single hop. In a multi-stage network is O log N, and in uh, in mesh is actually O, um, yeah, it's QRT of N, basically. Um, yeah, imagine that your network is, uh, like for example, you have 16 nodes, and you are making this as a 2D mesh four cross four. So then the, your, uh, the order of latency is actually a QRT of the number of nodes because the longest pass is actually going from, for example, the bottom uh, left to the top right. That's the longest pass. And that's exactly the square T of it. Okay. Let me see. Yeah, let me uh, finish the, the topology part and then we can have a break. Uh, now we want to look at more, uh, let's say direct topologies like mesh. This one is ring topology. Uh, which is again is very famous and has been used a lot. So basically, uh, processor nodes or everything uh, uh, like that, they are uh, connected to each other using a ring. So this is different from bus because this link is actually so from uh, going from this node to the, to uh, to this node, we have this link and it's not shared across different nodes in the network. So that's uh, the main difference between ring and uh, or let's say array and bus. I can also show the array quickly. Uh, okay. Let me see. So. Is it uh, visible on uh, YouTube? Okay. So there are, uh, let's say, some nodes, let's say processor. So when you uh, connect them in a bus uh, interconnection network, you have uh, this shared bus and each processor is actually connected to the bus. This is bus, right? But if you connect, uh, if I write here, is it good? Okay. Let's see. Add one more processor. So if you connect processor like this, let me use another color. This is a this is array that basically we connect every two consecutive nodes with the link. So now the length of actually your wires is uh, is fixed. Is actually the the distance between your nodes. But in your in bus, when you add another node, you need to make your bus longer, right? But here, if you add another node, it's just adding another link and connect to another node. So you don't increase the length of your links. So this topology is more scalable, let's say. 
And uh, if you want to make array uh, as a ring, you just need to, another color. If you make this link, oh, if you make this link, you make this array to ring topology, basically. So basically, array and ring topology are very similar to each other. The, the only difference is this wraparound link that you connect them. So with ring topology, you can reduce the, uh, basically, the, the diameter of your network uh, by half compared to array because so in array going from this node to 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 the long uh, to the forest node you need to actually go uh, n minus one um, you know hops but with with array you can actually take a wraparound or actually your uh, your uh, longest pass is actually from the uh, from the edge node to the center node kind of that you need to uh, make uh, o n over two uh, basically number of hops. Any question? So in the ring topology, the messages can go only in one direction or both directions? So we have both of them. Uh, we call unidirectional link or bidirectional link. So we can implement both of them. If it is bidirectional, you can go basically both uh, sides. But if it is unidirectional, it's not just go one side. So yeah. OK, let me share again. Are we back to the normal? <laughs> okay. So yeah, this is a ring topology. Uh, so it is cheap. Uh, the cost is uh, order of n, but it has a high latency. So the, the latency is order of n. So you need to make n hops or n over uh, two, depending on the single uh, unidirectional or uh, bidirectional. It's relatively good, not easy to scale. I mean, it's much easier to scale ring topology compared to boss, let's say. But at some point, this wraparound link is actually comes to, uh, it has some uh, overhead, basically. But it has been used uh, in Intel, for example, Haswell architecture, IBM cell, and many commercial systems today. So ring actually is one of the famous topology. As I said, it could be unidirectional, that single direction pathway, uh, simple topology and implementation, but it can be also bidirectional. So you have two uh, multi-directional pathway or multiple rings. So you can also consider uh, bidirectional link as two rings. That one of them is going from is going clockwise, the other one is going counterclockwise. So it reduces latency and improves scalability, but it's, it's a slightly more complex uh, injection policy. We need to select which ring to inject a packet into. So should we inject our packet to the clockwise ring or counterclockwise ring, for example? This is one example that uh, rings uh, has been used in existing system. Here, uh, the connection between cache banks, you can see this uh, ring agent. We don't know how exactly actually it has been uh, implemented, but essentially it has been used. Uh, rings can be actually also hierarchical. So you can have multiple rings in your system and, uh, and you can actually uh, connect them higher. So the, the first example here is a ring with four nodes, but uh, these uh, four uh, basically ring can be also connected to make a uh, bigger ring. And these are some other examples that you can see here. So by hierarchical link, you are more scalable uh, and you have lower latency, but it's also more complex, for sure. I mean, of course, the comparison here is a uh, hierarchical ring uh, instead of using uh, basically one single ring, right? So it's always good to know the baseline that we are comparing here. So it's more scalable. Hierarchical ring is more scalable compared to uh, using a single ring to connect all your nodes. 
So if you want to learn more about uh, hierarchical rings, this is a very nice paper uh, that Rachata actually, uh, he, uh, he leads this, uh, this work. Uh, it's about design and evalu evaluation of hierarchical rings with deflection routing. I strongly uh, suggest that you check this paper. Uh, this is another example of that, some extension work. And, uh, and this is also another uh, usage of hierarchical links in real system that uh, Huawei, uh, they, they use the hierarchical links in their system. Okay, uh, now we, uh, let's quickly go over mesh network. So mesh is actually extension, kind of extension of uh, uh, array network. So if you actually, if you know about the multiplication of two graphs, uh, we have the definition of multiplication of uh, two graphs. If you multiply basically uh, two array network, you can make a mesh network basically. So mesh is actually composed of, uh, composed of array network basically. So each node connected to four neighbors, four neighbors at most. There are some uh, nodes that they have less neighbor, for example, this one, it has only two neighbor, or this one has only three neighbors, but uh, usually, uh, knows they have four neighbors. And uh, so average latency is the order of uh, security of N, easy to lay out on chip, regular and equal links. links. Uh, it has also pa good pass diversity. So there are many ways to get from one node to another node. So imagine that you want to go from this node. Uh, let's, let me show it here. Okay, imagine that you want to go from this node to let's say this node. So one pass could be this, for example. The other one could be this one, for example. The other pass could be like this or many, many other passes. So there are many different passes that you can take and that uh, basically provides better pass diversity means that you have a better probably a fault tolerance in your topology. You have more feasibility to uh, to better balance the load in the network. And, and you have, essentially you will have better bandwidth. So mesh network has been used also in Tyler, for example, and many on-chip network prototypes. Tross is actually coming from ring. So if you uh, multiply ring topologies, you will reach to Tross network. It's just again like mesh, but the difference is that you need to make a ring. So you need to add the wraparound links basically uh, to make troughs. And I should also say that these topologies, they, they can be also defined by, dim by the dimension. So this is actually two dimensional mesh. We have X and Y. It could be three dimensional mesh. It's like a, it's like a cube. It's not, I don't want to say cube because it has a, it might be misleading because we have hypercube topology that we're going to see. But essentially we, can, essentially, we can have three-dimensional mesh. We can have four-dimensional mesh. And the same thing for Tross. It can be uh, basically two, 2D, 3D, and so on and so forth. So the, the interesting thing is that if you consider mesh, so 1D mesh is actually an array. Or in Tross, 1D Tross is actually a ring, right? So we can think about, uh, about them like that as well. So Toros uh, provides higher pass diversity and bisection uh, bandwidth compared to mesh, but is, uh, has higher cost, harder to lay out on chip. And there is also this unequal link links that there are some links, links that they are longer. So you may uh, end up using different frequency for your links, but actually uh, that has been, uh, addressed. There is another way of uh, floor planning the link topology, uh, sorry, the, the truss topology or the actually for the ring also topology, such that you have equal size uh, links. So in order to avoid uh, basically this long, lay, uh, long wire, you can actually increase the distance as a trade-off, increase the distance between every two nodes. But in, as a result of that, you have uh, equally sized uh, links that all of them can work with, uh, uh, with the same frequency. Another important topology is uh, tree. Um, 
So it's uh, considered as a hierarchical topology planner. So latency is a uh, O uh, log N. So good for local traffic. If your traffic is more or less local or neighboring, uh, three are quite good. But once you, uh, the moment that you need to go for uh, basically to the root because you want to make global uh, communication, then its co its cost is quite uh, the latency is not that good. So root essentially can uh, become a bottleneck, and that's the reason that in implementation of trees in real uh, chip they actually use fat tree. So whenever we go uh, to higher level of hierarchies, we also using uh, basically fat links. So it's it's not necessarily a fatter link. So it can be also several links. So it can basically this, uh, we may have, for example, connection from this node to this node, for example, with, uh, that provides more connection. But conceptually, if, for example, uh, we have eight bit links uh, here, we want to, for example, use uh, 16 bit links here, or, and also for this one. So uh, as you go to higher level of uh, uh, hierarchy, you want uh, more higher, you want to use uh, links with higher bandwidth, basically. So this is a one implementation of factory. As I said, you don't necessarily uh, add number of wires to each link, but you provide more links. So for example, this node is connected to this route and also this route. So it can reduce uh, the number of hops to reach to the destination node. This is another picture of CM5 fat tree. Okay, so any question about trees? Hypercube is uh, one of the famous uh, actually interconnection network that has been uh, used a lot for uh, interconnection network. It, uh, people don't use Hypercube a lot for on-chip network because of its uh, complexity. But for uh, for interconnection network has been used a lot. So hypercube is defined by n, like n dimensional cube, and essentially n uh, shows the number of nodes in the in the in the hypercube design. So if you're designing, uh, let's say one d one d n cube or one d cube, uh, it means that the number of nodes is uh, two to the power. Uh, Yes, two to the power of one. So by n, you, the number of nodes that you have in your hypercube is two to the power of n. So if you have a three cube or three cube hypercube, you have eight nodes, for example. So the latency is uh, all, uh, order of log n. Radix, the number of uh, edges that we have uh, connected to, to each node is actually all log n. So if you have, for example, 60, 64 if you have 64 nodes and you want to connect them by hypercube, what is the N for that? Six, exactly. So you need 60 hypercube. And uh, which means that each node in the, in the hypercube design is connected to six other nodes. So the radix is actually log N. And the number of links is that, so we have N nodes in the network and each node has, uh, degree of log n. So in the end, the, the order is, uh, the, the number of links is in the order of O n log n. So hypercube has very low latency. Uh, essentially the number of hops is quite low. So imagine for 64, uh, let's say node, if you connect it by hypercube, you, you can reach your destination, let's say the longest pass, uh, from one uh, source to the destination is actually six hops. Um, if you if you know about the how we connect, I can actually explain here how we connect nodes. So two uh, neighboring nodes, they actually uh, should have only one difference between their encoding. Like we are using a gray code, let's say, to uh, to address or encode different nodes in hypercube. So when we have uh, 4D hypercube, each node has four bits, for example. And if you want to uh, understand that, what are the nodes that they are connected to each other? Those nodes that they have only one difference in, in their bit, um, in one bit position, they are connected. So which means that the longest pass, for example, in 4D hypercube is 
going from zero, 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 for example, to one, 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 right? So, and, um, and each hop will uh, correct one of your space, one of your passes. Uh, and you reach to the destination uh, by that. So in the end, you need to take like four hops to reach to the destination in 4D hypercube. In 6D hypercube, you need to take six hops at most uh, for uh, 64 uh, nodes. But imagine that you want to connect 64 nodes with 2D mesh. So you need to uh, connect them using 2D mesh 8 cross 8. And then you have uh, basically your latency, the number of hops is around 16. So six is much lower than 16 hops, uh, which that's the reason that HyperQ has better latency. But in the end, it's hard to lay out in uh, 2D or 3D chips. Uh, this is an example of using a uh, hypercube in a real system, uh, Caltech uh, Cosmic Cube, that this is how they connect 64 nodes. And you can see that it's a mess if you want to have this hypercube in a uh, in a 2D uh, on chip, it's actually very hard. This is uh, the design hypercube when we have only eight nodes. But this is a hypercube that we need 64 nodes. In last year exam, actually, we had a question that we combine a hypercube with ring. It was interesting. So uh, we will uh, solve that question next week also. So we're gonna have a problem solving session next week that I will announce. And we will uh, basically go over the questions from last year and also some related questions. Okay. Now we want to go over routing, but before that we should take a break. Um, yeah, let's get back in. Eight minutes. Uh, Two forty
So for the for the exam, uh, we're gonna, as I said, we're gonna have a, a live problem solving session next week. Uh, I will send a post and an announcement on Moodle. But I will also put the link uh, for the problem solving sessions that we had or premiered last year. So you can also watch them. And uh, basically we went over all the many homework questions and uh, last, uh, I mean, past exams and we solved them during the lecture. So you can actually see, uh, learn from those examples and uh, get prepared for the exam. But our exam is usually easy, so don't worry. And it's only 30% of your uh, total weight. Okay, so yeah, we covered uh, more or less topology. I mean, for sure, there are a lot more to cover in topology, uh, but we don't have time. And I want to now go over uh, briefly routing algorithm. So there are uh, basically three types let's say at very high level, um, routing algorithms. So the first one is a category of arithmetic that basically you need to do some simple arithmetic to determine routes in uh, regular topologies. So based on the addresses uh, of, the, of the nodes, you can actually uh, find your paths uh, through the destination. Like dimension order routing in, uh, in meshes or toros is like arithmetic. So, Another uh, routing is uh, source-based, which is a uh, source specifies output port for each switch in, uh, in, in route. So when the packet is sending from source, uh, let's say A to destination B, uh, the source node is responsible to put all the nodes that this packet should take to reach to the destination. So the header of that packet is actually quite heavy by including all the nodes or intermediate nodes that we have to the destination. So that we call it as a source-based routing mechanism. Another one is, uh, uh, yeah, as I said, large header and simple switches. So we don't have uh, no, no control state and everything's happening uh, on control from the source router. Another, uh, uh, Routing is actually table lookup based. So there is a table at each router that depending on your uh, source or your packet ID or something like that, you basically look up uh, that table and uh, find your output port. So it has a much smaller header, but, uh, but you need to make uh, switches more complex. But uh, so you can also character, uh, categorize your routing algorithm in another definition, like the way that they are uh, offering a path to you, basically. So it, they could be deterministic, like always uh, chooses the same path for a communication, communicating source and destination pair. It could be oblivious, which uh, they choose different paths from source to destination, but without considering network state. So they are oblivious to the network state. Or they can be adaptive. They that can choose different paths from uh, source to the destination, uh, but it can be also adapted to the state of the network. So then, the, of course, the question is that how to adapt? So it could be, so we need some uh, sort of feedback in the network. We, we need to uh, have um, understanding of the congestion in the network. So people have developed a lot of uh, congestion awareness routing algorithm. So how we communicate the congestion information in the network, it could be local or global. There are some works that basically they combine uh, global congestion information and local and make decision based on that. So this is quite important. And also uh, using minimal or non-minimal paths. That's also another important thing uh, when we want to design adaptive routing. And what does it mean essentially? Um, I want to use the blackboard, but uh, it takes time to switch, but they, I think we can do it. So uh, consider a mesh topology, for example, Okay. 
So this is, a, for example, your source. And this is the destination. Let's maybe using another color. Source and destination. So there are uh, many, let's say, minimal uh, routing from this source to destination. I mean, not many. There are, I guess, only two in this example. So we have uh, this pass or this pass, basically, right? So there are two minimal paths from this source to destination. But you can also uh, design your adaptive. So basically, minimal adaptive routing should, should decide between either of these paths or that pass, basically, between these two paths here. But for example, from this source to, for example, this destination, we have higher number of passes. So uh, adaptive routing needs to define, needs to decide, uh, choose them also. But your adaptive routing algorithm can be also non-minimal. So sometimes adaptive routing realize that, okay, uh, the minimal pass is actually congested. So why not actually taking a, a non-minimal pass uh, by the idea of basically uh, passing through the nodes that they are hopefully less busy. So it can actually, for example, go like this. So uh, this is a non-minimal pass that might be preferred if, for example, even though we are uh, having uh, a number, I mean, higher number of hops from source to the destination, but the number of hop is not the only metric that uh, basically uh, results your uh, latency. Actually, one of the another important metric is actually your queuing time. So the, the the amount of time time that you need to wait to take your channel. And once the pass is congested, it makes sense to use a longer pass with higher number of hops, but hopefully less crowded, so you can reach to your destination faster. Any question? So basically, non-minimal fully adaptive routing algorithm. They are let's say the most uh, complicated routing algorithm that they need to somehow decide uh, when to do minimal, when to do non-minimal, and among all these paths, which paths basically the, the packet should take. Okay. So deterministic routing, as I said, all packets between the same source and destination pair uh, take the same pass. Uh, one, uh, let's say, um, uh, famous example of that is actually dimension order routing. So you, we first traverse the dimension X and then traverse the dimension Y. Like uh, for example, in 2D mesh, we call it as XY routing. Uh, like, for example, in this. In this figure. So if you want to, for example, uh, have X, Y routing from this source to the destination, you have to first go X and then go Y. So there is no actually different pass. And for example, from the from this source, for example, to this destination, even though we have many, many different paths, but if your routing is deterministic, you should actually go only this direction. You need to first go X and make sure that you don't have difference uh, in X dimension by your destination, and then you can take the Y and uh, basically reach your destination. It could be, it doesn't need to be only X, Y. It could be also only Y, X. So for example, this path is Y, X. So in the, but in the end, it's deterministic. So you cannot change it. So it is simple. And it also uh, doesn't have deadlock. So no, no cycles in resource allocation. We're going to briefly see about deadlock soon. But yeah. So it could lead to high contention because you have only one pass or that is, and, and does not exploit uh, pass diversity. It's also not good for uh, fault tolerance. So since you have only one deterministic pass from a pair of source to destination, if that pass for some reason is not available, some links are faulty, so you don't, you cannot reach your destination anymore. Even though there are some other passes that 
connect uh, the source to the destination, but your routing algorithm is not intelligent enough to use them. So this is the concept of deadlock. Essentially, uh, the definition is quite simple. There is a no forward progress. It could uh, is usually caused by uh, circular dependencies on resources. So each packet waits for a buffer occupied by another packet downstream. Uh, we have also this definition of upstream and downstream. When, when a packet goes from uh, router A to B, basically, router A is upstream, router B is downstream. So here, for example, you can see these circular dependencies. So uh, basically, uh, packet one wants to go to this node, but there is a packet uh, occupying this buffer, and this buffer cannot be empty because it also wants to take this pass, but this pass is also, uh, the buffer is busy because it also wants to send another packet. And then in the end, everyone is waiting for the, another uh, basically packet. So in the end, you have these circular uh, dependencies. There are some topologies that they are, they have these circular uh, dependencies in their design, like, uh, like for example, ring. You always have this circular. So in a ring topology, it's actually very easy to get into deadlock situation. But in mesh, uh, actually routing algorithm can handle it. We're going to see also how we can uh, avoid deadlock. But that's a very high level you know, from uh, basically explanation of deadlock. Do you have any question? OK. So. Yeah, the, so basically to handle deadlock, we can, uh, we can have different uh, basically scenarios. One is to avoid cycles in routing. Design your routing algorithm such that we don't have deadlock. So we don't have this cycle anymore. Uh, so in order to do that, dimension order routing, like XY is one example, because I need to use network. <laughs> Uh, so in order to avoid the deadlock, we can actually use uh, consider the how we have these circular dependencies. So in a you can have basically considering that the this circular um, dependency can be uh, can be clockwise or counterclockwise. In a two D mesh, we can consider that we have uh, basically we can have four turns that they can make this clockwise uh, circular, or we can have four turns that they can make these counterclockwise circular dependencies. Right. So in a mesh, if we consider here is um, up is north, this is uh, the south, north, uh, east, and west, we can actually name these uh, terms. Like this one is going to north and then east. Uh, this one is uh, east, south, or this one is south, west. Or this one is, for example, uh, West, north, right? So we can also name the terms in the counterclockwise circle as well. So one way to avoid deadlock is actually making sure that some of these terms cannot happen. So in X, Y routing, for example, we always need to go first X and then we can go Y, right? So there are some certain terms that cannot happen in with X, Y routing, any idea? Exactly. North, east, and southwest are the two terms in clockwise, uh, uh, basically routing that cannot happen with X, Y. And similarly, uh, we cannot have east, north. No, oh, sorry. Uh, we cannot have uh, north, west, and uh, southeast. 
in uh, in a counterclockwise uh, cycle. So essentially, we remove uh, two turns from uh, clockwise, and we remove two turns in counterclockwise. So we only have four remaining turns, and with that, so our uh, basically routing algorithm is uh, is deadlock free, and it's also deterministic. So you can actually prove that uh, since you have only you eliminate four turns, you have you reach to a deterministic routing algorithm here. But if you actually uh, uh, be, uh, basically make it a bit more intelligent and remove only uh, one turn from each of these cycles. Then you allow, let's say, six turns. You have more, uh, let's say, pass diversity, so you are not deterministic anymore. You are, let's say, partially adaptive. You are not fully adaptive because you cannot take all the turns, but you are partially adaptive, and you are also at the same time deadlock-free. So that's actually the idea of using a turn model, uh, turn model routing algorithm theory. So there's a theory that gives you an idea how you can eliminate some of these turns uh, such that to make your uh, uh, basically uh, routing algorithm deadlock free. For example, one pop, uh, popular example of that is a routing algorithm of vest first which means that if you want to go to west, you need to, first, you need to first take west, and then you can take north and south, which means actually you are xy when you are going to the, when you are going to the west uh, side of your network. But you can be fully adaptive if you, when you go to the east side of your network. So if you check, you will see that as, you can also do it as your homework. You will see that uh, there are some terms that they are eliminated with west first. But overall, we have six terms allowed, which uh, gives us some uh, adaptivity. Any question? So these are uh, kind of you know deadlock avoidance techniques. So routing algorithm does not allow to have deadlock to begin with. But there are also some other way uh, of handling that. That since uh, deadlock is not that common in many uh, in many cases. So you don't, uh, the idea is that we don't want to limit the, the routing or pass diversity just because of deadlock that can happen with some very small uh, likelihood. So people actually uh, do some basically technique that they avoid, uh, they detect deadlock and they need to have a design a technique to recover from that deadlock situation. For example, there is this uh, idea of using escape pass which uh, coming from, I guess, uh, if I remember correctly, from Duato uh, theory. So you need to have some escape pass such that whenever you have a deadlock, you have escape pass that you can take that pass and reach your destination. So you don't let this uh, uh, circular uh, circle to happen. And also, basically, you need to detect and break deadlock. And sometimes you need to preemption of buffers or something like that, or you can you can basically, you can also somehow drop some packets or you can eject some packets and then re-inject them to the network. Basically, there are many ways, but all of them, they need to somehow detect uh, the deadlock. And of course, the detection mechanism is not perfect. So sometimes they detect this as deadlock, but it's not actually a deadlock. But uh, they, they can try to basically improve the accuracy of um, uh, detecting deadlock. So this is a term model to avoid deadlock, which I already mentioned. Uh, the first, uh, th this one, an example that we have four terms allowed by the XY routing algorithm. And as I said, we have, uh, we don't have deadlock anymore. This is uh, one way, for example, of uh, removing one term from each of these uh, basically circle, but actually you cannot uh, randomly remove uh, turns from these circles and make sure that uh, your uh, routing algorithm is deadlock free. If you actually look at it carefully, you will see that combination of remaining uh, turns, they can actually make a cycle. And if you, for example, remove uh, turns like this, your routing algorithm is not deadlock free. So this paper discuss about how we need to choose uh, how we, uh, we can choose the turns that we can remove from this uh, turn model. So it's not, uh, 
basically we cannot randomly cut some terms. Any question? Okay. So OpliBS routing is actually making different uh, routes from source to destination, but it's actually, it's not uh, uh, adapt, it's not adaptive to the state of the network. So the goal is to balance network load. One idea is actually to randomly choose an intermediate destination and route to it first, then route from there to the destination. It's actually called a valiance algorithm that uh, in order to send data from a source to the destination, we pick randomly a uh, intermediate route and send our packet like using, let's say, XY routing algorithm from the source to the intermediate node. And then from intermediate node to the destination, again, with XY routing. So combination of these two gives you some adaptivity. But uh, since you are choosing the intermediate node randomly, you are oblivious of the routing, of the uh, state of the network. So it randomizes or balance network node, uh, but yeah, it's, all, but it's also non-minimal. So this uh, intermediate uh, node can increase uh, the number of hops. But might be okay, as I said, when your, uh, your uh, network is highly congested. When the network is highly congested, it means that the Q latency is actually defines the total latency of your packet, more or less. So it's in, it makes sense to take higher number of hops such that uh, hopefully you get less uh, busy links. So the, there is optimization that, for example, we should do this on high load because on low load, we don't need that. On high load, we can actually use that. And actually in high load, we are uh, not bottlenecked by the number of hops usually. So also we can restrict the intermediate node to be close in the, in the same uh, quadrant, for example. So there could be also some observations that if you are interested, you should check the paper for more detail. There are also some uh, more works on valiance algorithm that you can also check. But yeah, adaptive routing uh, can be minimal adaptive, which I already discussed. Um, so router, router uses network state uh, basically to understand the congestion of, uh, of the network and they decide uh, which path we should take. But the important thing is that in minimal adaptive routing, we always take minimal paths from the source to the destination. But it could be also non-minimal fully adaptive that uh, can misroute packet to non-productive output based on the network state uh, in order to avoid busy links basically. So in minimal adaptive routing, we need to be aware of local congestion. I would say also global congestion of the network. Uh, so minimally restricts uh, achievable link utilization. Uh, so it has a good load balance. In non-minimal fully adaptive, we can achieve better network utilization and load balance, but it needs to guarantee live lag freedom. So with, with, uh, with non-minimal fully adaptive routing, you you have all the issues that adaptive routing has, like the deadlock, but at the same time, you need to also deal with live lock issue. So there is a, there is a risk that your packet gets uh, transferred in the, in the network without reaching to the destination, just um, in a live lock, uh, basically, manner. So we need to, in non-minimal routing algorithm, we need to guarantee that live lock does not happen. So more on adaptive routing can avoid the, faulty links and router. So adaptive routing is not only for performance, as I said, it's also for uh, better reliability. So we want, the idea is to route, uh, to route packets around faults. So deterministic routing cannot handle faulty components, as I said, need to change the routing table to disable faulty uh, routes, assuming the faulty uh, link and router is detected, basically. But, uh, but basically, with, with adaptive routing algorithm, you can actually avoid that, and you can uh, route around faults. If you are interested, this, this paper is actually quite discussed this topic in detail, and um, it's quite interesting. Yeah, this is a, so fault tolerance and guaranteed uh, delivery, because in uh, ba basically in a non-minimal routing algorithm, we need to make sure that we we need to guarantee that we packets are delivered to the destination. Uh, it has been discussed in this paper. 
So now let's uh, quickly talk about buffering and flow controller, flow control. So if you remember in the beginning, we had this topology, uh, routing algorithm, and now we want to talk about buffering and flow control. There are a lot more actually to discuss and uh, in routing algorithm, but I just want uh, wanted to give a high level view of that. So we already discussed actually flow control. Uh, this circuit and packet switching is uh, one of them. So, and I don't want to basically repeat the, uh, the trade-off between circuit switch and packet switching, as you can already also see in here. And, uh, and in, in real uh, system, it's also, it makes sense to have a combination of circuit switching and packet switching, as I already mentioned. But now we want to see how we can actually implement, for example, packet switch network. So there is a definition of packet format that you need to define when you design this packet switch network. There should be a header for your packet, which uh, having routing and control information, like the, the source ID, the destination ID, or for example, in, in source uh, in source routing algorithm, you need to also put the ID of all intermediate uh, routers in the header. Another uh, part of packet is payload, which is uh, which carries data, um, basically, and can be further divided. So it can be a uh, payload can be actually divided in many chunks or small pieces, which we can we call it them as fleets. And we have also this error code that generally uh, it uh, comes at tail of packets, so it can be generated on the way out. So when the when the packet arrives to the destination, we can check that uh, the error code to make sure that we receive the packet uh, correctly or not. So now uh, let's see how we can handle contention. So two packets trying to use the same link at the same time. What do we do? So you can see that uh, there is, I don't know if you can see that. Can, can you guys see the arrows? It's not visible, I guess, here, but, but essentially there are two arrows. Uh, one is coming from uh, north, I mean, top to, uh, to left, up to left, and another arrow coming from down to left. So the, the, these are the two packets, and they want to take this uh, left link. So how we can uh, basically handle this contention? We need to arbitrate across them, right? And we need to buffer uh, another one. Or the other one, uh, so the one that basically cannot take the output, we can we can buffer it or we can drop it, basically. Or we can misrote the one, uh, or we call it deflection. So there is a routing algorithm that we call it uh, as hot potato, meaning that uh, routers cannot hold uh, data because they don't have buffer, which has analogy to hot potato. So you, you, you can only you know pass hot potato to the another router, and you don't really care because you just want to get rid of that hot potato as soon as possible. <laughs> so you just pass them to the to the next one. So it's called it misroute one. So there is a trade off for sure. I mean buffer you need buffer space, dropping packet you don't need to buffer. But the thing is that you need to resend um, your data again, and that has over overhead. And misroute one is can be an interesting uh, way to handle it, so you don't need buffer. But uh, the problem is that uh, you are you are in the danger of uh, having a live light, and you you need to somehow handle it. And some packets they 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 are taking a lot of uh, hops to to reach the destination. So basically, it has also some overhead, and actually. Uh, people show, I mean, uh, we have done also a lot of work in this direction. And essentially, this is not very good in high loads. So when, when your network load is uh, relatively low, you can actually handle uh, miss road. In, uh, but when the traffic load is high, you need to come up with something between. You need some buffers. You need to, you can also miss road. So essentially, combination of these techniques uh, can be used again. So Remember uh, a symmetric design again here also. So there are different uh, uh, flow control methods. So here are some examples of them. Circuit switching, uh, bufferless, uh, which you don't have buffer, and this is flow control also. Store and forward is a packet-based switching. 
virtual cut through is again packet based switching and wormhole is uh, fleet based switching. We're gonna quickly see them. So circuit switching, uh, we, we already discussed it. Like, uh, so resource allocation granularity is large. So the idea is pre-allocate resources across multiple switches for a given flow. So need to send a probe uh, to set up the pass for pre-allocation. So you need to set up a pass and then you can use it. So no need for buffering, no contention, flows performance is isolated and can handle arbitrary messages, message sizes. But as a downside, uh, lower link utilization, two flows, uh, flows cannot use the same link and handshake overhead to set up a circuit, basically. In bufferless deflection routing, uh, the key idea is that packets are never buffered in the network. When two, back, uh, when two uh, packets uh, contend for the same link, one is deflected. So uh, that's the idea for bufferless routing. So imagine that these two packets are uh, wants to go to the destination. So they arrive to the this intermediate node together. Most of them uh, wants to, so in, if we want to reach to the destination in a minimal pass, most of them needs to take this output, but it's not possible because we have only one link. So for the blue packet, we actually we decide to deflect it, and we deflect a blue packet. And basically, it arrives to the destination. So the idea is that hopefully, after by deflecting this blue uh, packet, it's getting a, we uh, we get some time, right? And uh, when it arrives to the destination, it's also free. So it's also you can also consider this deflection as a buffering again, but you don't really buffer in the router. You buffer in different nodes, like in a, um, in, in different uh, time in different time windows or several cycles, consecutive cycles. So deflection is also conceptually similar to buffering, but you know, for several uh, cycles, let's say. So new traffic can be injected whenever there is a free output link. And that's the only uh, basic uh, consideration here. So in bufferless deflection uh, router, input buffers are eliminated. Packets are buffered in pipeline latches and on network links. I mean, we need, as I said, we need some latch or register in order to make sure that we don't uh, have long combinational circuit in the network. So there are some uh, registers, but essentially they are not buffers. So they are not like a FIFO buffer that can you know, store uh, several uh, packets uh, in them. So instead of router architecture like this, that we have several buffers and then we have a crossbar uh, that basically selects uh, input uh, input link to the output link. We can have this deflection routing logic that essentially inputs are connected to the output using this uh, crossbar. <coughs> so there are uh, several issues in bufferless deflection routing, which makes it actually very interesting to address them. Uh, the first one is actually live like, because you deflect router meaning that you are using non-minimal routing um, passes probably. So you are also in the danger of live lock. How, uh, how should we control that uh, one packet, one poor packet is not deflected all the time, you know? And it's, so it should reach to the destination at some point. There are some uh, way to handle it. If you are interested, uh, I would suggest that you check this uh, book chapter. Uh, so, Basically, uh, we have some re resulting uh, router complexity. Now we have some other complexity issue that we need to handle it. Performance and congestion at high loads. As I said, uh, basically uh, this bufferless routing algorithm is not very, uh, is, is not perfect in, uh, in high congested network. So, but you don't need to use also a lot of buffers to handle that. If you check the papers, you will see that combining uh, bufferless uh, idea with some small buffer spaces, they can actually uh, make a good, very good trade-off and provide uh, good performance for both uh, high congested loads and, uh, I mean, high load and low load uh, traffic. So yeah, the, there are many works actually in this direction that we have done and I would suggest that you check them. 
We usually also have another lecture of in network on chip that we go over bufferless network architecture in more detail. Uh, I will uh, basically, you can also check it from last year, but we may also premiere it, uh, this lecture this, this time also. Yeah, this minimally buffered deflection router is actually the way to handle, uh, uh, have the basically the good of the, the best of two words, like the bufferless and buffered. So you don't have a lot of buffer since you have this bufferless idea, but you have a very small minimally buffered also in your router just to make sure that you are not, uh, you can handle congestion well. And bufferless also has been used in uh, hierarchical rings. Uh, you can check this paper if you're interested. As you can see, there are many, many works in bufferless interconnect design. And uh, basically buffer in, bufferless interconnect result has been used in real system as well uh, in, a, in a chip from Huawei. Okay. So the next uh, flow control is actually store and forward. So this is one of the packet-based flow control. Uh, so packet copied uh, entirely into network router before moving to the next node. So flow control unit is the entire packet. So here you can see that we have a, a packet that has four chunks or four fleets, let's say. This packet wants to send from this source to this destination. So basically we need to transfer all this packet to the next node before Initiate, uh, initiating the next transfer from to the to the neighboring route. Basically, the whole packet should be stored to the to the downstream router, and then we can move on and continue sending that to the to the next router. So as you can see, that the, this leads to high per packet latency, and it requires buffering for entire packet in each node. Uh, how we can handle it if some there are some packets in the network that they are significantly large, right? So you need to have a space for those packets. So you need to have a space for the worst case packet size, for example, which is one of the limitation of this technique. So uh, there are uh, in some uh, networks, imagine that in, in your network, there are some packets, most of packets, they are actually quite a small, let's say a few hundreds of kilobyte, but there are also some packets that they are in megabyte size or, or more. So you need to have buffers that can um, house a megabyte of data, even if you need them for, let's say, a minority of cases. But then the, the immediately, uh, immediately we can ask this question that can we do better? So cut through flow control or virtual cut through flow control is, uh, is one way to improve. So essentially it uh, fixed one of the issues of uh, store and forward and uh, we can pipeline the transfer from the source to the destination. Still, uh, the, the flow control granularity is actually packet. So you, need sh you should be able to store the whole packet on every node, but you don't need to wait uh, to receive all the packets and then proceed to the next router. So start forwarding as soon as header is received and resources uh, allocated, like buffer, channel, etc. So we can have this kind of implementation that so the the header arrives to the destination to the to the next router we need to spend some time for routing of uh, that header so to find the routing uh, which output port basically this header should take the header also needs to basically uh, we, the, the router needs to do this arbitration uh, or allocation for this header but as soon as uh, the output port is allocated to this header, we can move on and we can send the header. And essentially we have this kind of, you know, pipelining uh, in sending our packet. So it can uh, basically significantly uh, reduce uh, the latency, but still uh, we need to allocate buffers and channel bandwidth for full uh, packets. So what if packets are large? So the idea is to use wormhole flow control. So packets are broken into potentially smaller fleets, like buffer bandwidth allocation unit. 
and uh, fleets are sent across the fabric uh, in a wormhole fashion, basically. So body, uh, body of packet always uh, follows the head and uh, tail follows body also. It's a completely pipeline. And if head blocked, rest of packet stops. So the thing is that in virtual uh, cut through, uh, when when uh, basically uh, imagine that in this in this node, uh, we we have to block this packet for some reason because this destination node is not ready yet. So since we have enough, uh, let's say uh, enough buffering space, we can actually uh, house all the fleets or all the packet in this intermediate node. And then we can uh, move on to the next router whenever it's free. But in wormhole switching, we don't have uh, enough. I mean, the idea is that we don't have enough buffer. So you, you, you need to actually store the, uh, the, the, the whole packet um, across different nodes, right? Whenever it's, it's uh, basically when, when the head uh, blocked in the network. So routing uh, and like the source and destination information is only in the head. So basically uh, body and tail, they should follow the head such that uh, they, they know where to go. Otherwise uh, they don't have any, let's say uh, destination or uh, flow control information in the, in the fleet, in the body and tail fleet. So they always need to follow the head. So we need to keep the state in router that this packet which is specified by that header is actually taking these, uh, for example, output north. So body and tail they should also take that output. So latency almost independent of distance for long messages. This is very good. So since your uh, transfer is actually a pipeline, which is also the case in virtual cut through more or less. But yeah, since uh, your transfer is pipeline, you don't uh, really bottleneck by the number of hops that you are making. and uh, especially if your packet is so large. We have a, a formula uh, for calculating latency later that we can uh, see why is that the case. So uh, wormhole flow control has good advantages. So over store and forward flow control, it has lower latency and more efficient buffer utilization, but it has limitation. It suffers from head of line blocking if head fleet cannot move due to the contention, another worm cannot proceed even though links may be idle. So here uh, there are two flows, like flow one and two. And uh, basically you can see that even though this two wants to go to this direction, it cannot uh, proceed because, because this one, so, the, uh, so, okay, let me repeat it. So there are two uh, flows and in input queues. This uh, fleet wants to take to the output one. This one wants also to take the output one, right? One of them takes the uh, output, this one, and this one is to blocked basically, right? Since uh, one is blocked and this queue is actually considered as FIFO, right? So this uh, another fleet, even though it wants to go to this output two, which is uh, hopefully free, but it cannot proceed because of the, the head fleet, which is blocked here. So we call this uh, phenomena as head of line blocking. <coughs> so yeah, this is a uh, more information about head of line blocking. So a worm can be before another in the router input buffer. Uh, due to FIFO nature, the second worm cannot be scheduled even though it may need to access another output port or potentially free output port. So this uh, animation actually shows the head of line blocking issue. So there are uh, two flows here, like the red and blue. Uh, blue ones wants to go to this uh, basically destination and red one wants to go to that destination. So we are sending a blue, uh, basically fleet, but at some point this intermediate node uh, gets full and we cannot proceed anymore. So basically we need to store uh, this blue packet in this intermediate node, right? And then uh, 
the red one is actually sending a transfer in the network, but even but it cannot proceed, even though this link is uh, idle. Why? Because it actually is waiting for the blue one to get scheduled. So that's the head of line blocking issue. How we can fix that? We use a virtual channel. So we call it virtual channel flow control. That essentially you uh, divide a serial a FIFO to uh, several parallel channels or call it, we call them as virtual channels. So now uh, your, your buffers are divided uh, by two and essentially, so you are sending blue one and now it's uh, basically full so you cannot proceed anymore. But the good thing is that you can keep sending red one because your channels virtually are um, divided. It's actually a very simple idea, but it works well. So this is a modern virtual channel-based router that you have basically for every uh, input channel, we have a VC buffer. So we have several parallel buffers that we call them virtual channel. And basically input channel should be mux to different uh, parallel channels or parallel buffer or virtual channels. And then uh, one of these virtual channels gets uh, permitted to access the crossbar and go to the output channel. So that's the implementation of a virtual channel based router. But virtual channels are not only used to handle head of light blocking. There are also other reasons to use them. One of them is deadlock avoidance, like um, basically enforcing switching to a different set of virtual channel on some terms can break the cyclic dependency of resources. For example, in a, in a ring topology, as I said, we have this wraparound, right? You can make this, uh, you make this contract that uh, whenever I want to take the wraparound link, I will uh, go to the, another virtual channel. So I use virtual channel number zero, let's say, for all the, uh, for all the transfer or for the, all the links. But whenever I want to take the wraparound link, I will go to the virtual channel number one. So you can actually uh, specify a different set of virtual channels and, and basically um, um, and put some restriction on how the, what are the terms that it can uh, use. You can also enforce uh, order on VCs, like the, the order of VCs that you can take. So in the beginning, you can, for example, take, uh, you should take only uh, VC number one, but after some, time, after some hops, you can take, you should take VC number two, and you can have an order. Or you can have the, in, uh, you can restrict the number of virtual channels once you are going into the network. In the beginning, you can use the whole virtual channels, like say eight virtual channels that you have. But after some, uh, after each hop, you remove one of these VCs from your set. So essentially uh, with these, you can uh, make some deadlock -like avoidance. Or for example, using escape virtual channels that whenever you have a, you detect the deadlock, you take escape virtual channels to uh, basically to uh, to break that uh, cyclic dependency. And virtual channels also has been used also in order to uh, provide a protocol level deadlock. I mean, to avoid protocol level deadlock. So protocol and the cache coherency also can have a deadlock. And in order to not have that, we need to ensure address and data packets use different virtual channels. There is also a very nice uh, research in that direction, how to avoid uh, a deadlock in our cache coherence protocol uh, by using uh, different virtual channels. But another use case of virtual channel is actually to prioritize of the traffic classes. So some virtual channels can have higher priority than others, which can affect uh, basically your allocation policy, your arbitration policy can be aware of that. And if the, a packet is coming from high priority virtual channel, probably that packet has higher chances to win the allocation slot. So it's just a review a slide. I mean, any question on virtual channel? Yes. Uh, there is a question on YouTube, but it's not about virtual channels. But yeah. But you fine. stop now, so I'm gonna ask. Yeah. Uh, it's about the bufferless interconnects. And the question is, could it benefit from nodes without a core? Uh, if you add sub nodes into the mesh uh -huh. that does not have cores, uh -huh. uh, does it help 
uh, and also uh, has there been processors with bufferless routing? So, so the first part of the question is actually adding some notes that they are, they don't have uh, they are only switch basically, and they don't have uh, but. Essentially, now we are uh, mixing the direct and indirect uh, topology, which actually has been also used in the in the past. There are some papers that they are doing that. So in the in the mesh network, but you, somehow you need to uh, for bufferless for those nodes that you have in the middle, you need to also somehow control them. You, you cannot. Uh, so you can use them to deflect um, basically your traffic. But essentially, you need to also make sure that you don't get misrouted on all of them and you, you can reach to the destination somehow. And the second part of the question about uh, using a bufferless in real devices, actually, yes, uh, I showed that uh, and there was a uh, design, uh, I mean, real de device from Huawei that they actually use ring topology and they use bufferless knock there. But yeah, thanks a lot for the question. Okay. So it, uh, this aside, quickly uh, review the flow control that we already uh, discussed. Store and forward is like this. There are many animations. I will play them quickly. Uh, cut through or wormhole, they're actually very similar. Uh, the only difference is that in wormholes, in cut through uh, switching, you have to, the flow control makes, have to, um, the flow control has to have enough buffers per router uh, to, to house uh, any large, uh, any size, let's say, packets. But in wormhole, we don't have that constraint. Wormhole uh, uh, flow control was quite uh, famous in the beginning because uh, adding uh, buffers was quite hard and it was very, uh, let's say, costly. So people were uh, using wormhole switching a lot. But now we are something between. Like for many uh, packets, uh, like let's say, uh, nominal size packets, uh, virtual, uh, we are in kind of virtual cut through because our buffers are large enough. But there are also some packets, could be some packets that they are significantly large and we don't basically make our buffers large enough for them. So for, uh, for those packets, we are using wormhole switching basically. So now we are again in the combination of uh, these uh, cut through and wormhole. So head of line blocking is also an issue that we discuss, and with but by virtual channel we can actually avoid that. Okay. Any question? So in in network when you have buffer, you somehow need to communicate buffer availability. So there could be, uh, I mean th these are three uh, let's say a very high level ways to communicate that. One is uh, credit-based flow control that uh, basically the upstream uh, router knows how many buffers are available in downstream router. And downstream uh, passes back credits to upstream, like the number, like the, the, the number of uh, available buffers. And, um, and basically upstream router can make decision based on that. <coughs> Imagine that uh, in, in one example that I showed, um, let me, let's hope we have, still have the picture. Yeah. So imagine that you have adaptive routing algorithm and you want to send your packet from this source to the destination. There could be uh, one way is to send from through this pass. The other one is to send through this pass, right? So this source actually can check the credit um, that received from the next router. Imagine that this router gives, uh, says that, oh, I have like three credit, meaning that my, I have three free, free slot in my, uh, in my buffer. This router says like, I have, let's say eight credits. So potentially it means that this router that has higher credit is less crowded. So this source can take this buffer, this router, for example, to send uh, the packet. Um, but this is only uh, is only aware of the local congestion, like the local. But there are some works that they show that if you only uh, look at the next hop, you may be mislead. And it's important that you have a, also view of global congestion somehow. So people are trying to combine uh, credit information uh, to the to the source router or any uh, current router to make uh, uh, congestion awareness 
uh, decision for routing. So another flow control can be on and off flow control that basically it's not about, uh, you, do, you don't have flexibility. You just say on, meaning that you can send packet, or off, meaning that you, you cannot send packet. So uh, upstream router needs, uh, should wait uh, when receive off signal from downstream router. And another flow control could be ACK and NAC. So for every basically uh, transfer, uh, downstream router needs to send ACK that I received the packet, basically. So upstream router optimistically sends downstream. But buffer cannot, when buffer cannot be deallocated, sorry, uh, upstream router optimistically sends the data to downstream, but buffer uh, in upstream router cannot be deallocated until uh, ACK NAC received. So when downstream uh, router communicates ACK, then upstream router can actually deallocate the buffer and uh, use that for uh, future communication. So Inefficient, uh, so this I can like flow control some inefficiently utilizes the buffer space sometimes. So you can see this flow control in this picture. Uh, like first, take a look for I mean, uh, consider credit base. There are two nodes. Uh, so node one wants to send data to node two. Imagine that uh, currently we don't have credit, but node two. Uh, basically uh, transfer some fleets, basically some fleets in that uh, node two departs router. So now uh, node two has some credit in that buffer. So this credit has been, uh, should be transmitted to node one and node one needs to process that credit. And at time T3 realized that, okay, now node two has some credit and I can send data. So it starts sending a fleet uh, to node two, and at the same time, needs to send credit back to the to, to its uh, upstream router because it's a recursive, uh, uh, let's say, behavior. And uh, so, when when node two receive this fleet, it also needs to process. And essentially, this is a credit uh, credit round uh, trip delay, right? The the node zero, which we have not shown here. This is the time takes for that to real uh, to realize that oh I have some credit that can send so it's a kind of it can be actually backtracked to to uh, to, to, to the office stream routers. So this round trip credit delay uh, the time between when uh, buffer empties and when next fleet can be processed from that buffer entry uh, it has significant uh, throughput degradation if there are few buffers. So important to uh, size buffers to tolerate credit uh, turnaround time. So nowadays, actually, we have, uh, I mean, relatively large uh, buffers such that we can tolerate credit. Uh, we don't have, uh, we can tolerate this uh, credit turnaround time. This uh, on and off uh, flow control. So basically, uh, node one starts sending fleet. And imagine that now, uh, the, so we have, we need to define a threshold. We don't wait to essentially the buffer gets full and then inform that basically I cannot, uh, I cannot receive anything. So there should be a threshold uh, for saying that, okay, now is, uh, I want to transfer a send off signal to the node one. So basically we uh, prefetch kind of uh, the off signal uh, to, the, to the node one. But it takes some time for node one to receive that off signal. So node one keeps receiving some fleets. So that's the reason we need to design that threshold well, basically. Once uh, node one receives this off signal, it process and then it stops sending fleet. Um, node two also transfer fleets uh, to the to the next node. At some point we have this F uh, on threshold. Uh, and then node two sends the on signal again to node one. Node one process this and send fleet basically. So it's important to set this threshold nicely um, in order to make sure that we are optimizing or utilizing our buffers well. And we don't wait also a lot. Any question?
So, yeah, we have a, uh, still we have some time. So let's uh, quickly also discuss about interconnection network performance. But I will wait for a few, I mean, second if there is a question. Okay. So basically interconnection network performance, we usually have such uh, kind of curves, which is very common whenever you have a, whenever you have a uh, resource that essentially uh, you, you input or you send requests to that resource at, at some certain load. And then uh, the latency of uh, servicing uh, uh, in, in that resource, like the uh, service time is actually has such usually behavior. So when you increase your load, uh, your latency is getting increased, but it is not bad until some time, but after some, uh, some certain threshold or some certain rate, you will see that your basically latency uh, jump. And then uh, that's actually the saturation point of your network. So we usually have this, we have this minimum latency given by topology. So each topology defines, uh, that has a minimum latency, like the number of hops. Like the, for example, as I said, bus topology, for example, has only single hop. But there are some, uh, depending on the topology, you have a minimum latency, like the minimum number of hops. But depending on your routing algorithm, you have also minimum latency given by routing algorithm. And you have some latency com combination of topology, routing, and flow control. So basically, this uh, latency is considered as zero load latency. That the minimum latency that we are observing in the network, um, even when there is no traffic, so when we, we have zero load latency, so we meaning that we don't have the issue or the uh, the latency of queuing, uh, still uh, our latency is not zero and we have some latency. But, uh, but the, the gap, uh, the cap of this figure is actually uh, defined by uh, throughput. So this is the throughput given by topology. Each topology has the highest, we can actually calculate the, the highest bandwidth that each topology can tolerate. But, uh, when you use the routing algorithm, you actually limit some of the bandwidth. So you cannot imagine that, uh, for example, for deterministic routing algorithm, you are not using uh, the whole parallelism or bandwidth of the network effectively. So you're limiting uh, some uh, basically bandwidth. So this is the throughput given by routing, and this is the throughput given by flow control. So in the end, uh, this is the saturation throughput that injection rate at which uh, latency uh, asymptote. So this is the ideal latency uh, formula that's uh, solely due to, uh, to wire delay between source and destination. So essentially uh, the ideal latency is that uh, D, which is uh, Manhattan distance, the distance between two points measure along axis at right angles. And V is the propagation velocity. L is the packet size. And B is the channel bandwidth, basically. So meaning that you have a minimum latency that you need to spend to reach to, to your destination router. And beyond that, also, you need to, as you are pipeline, you also need to wait for um, packet size divided by channel bandwidth, because you need to also spend some clocks to receive the whole um, packets in the end. But you don't need to times the number of, I mean, this L over B to the D over V because your transfer actually is pipeline. But in reality, the actual latency is something like this, that uh, you need to add some uh, variables or parameters to this uh, latency. One of them is actually the number of hops and router latency. So uh, people actually have been trying a lot to to make a router, uh, let's say single cycle, for example, using a speculative routing or a speculative allocation techniques. But essentially um, router has latency. So it needs some time to do the routing and do the allocation. And we have, and the moment that we have virtual channel, you need to do virtual channel allocation and then you need to do switch allocation. So basically there are many uh, 
functions or let's say pipeline steps inside the router and you need to spend time on them. So you have this router latency that uh, you need to uh, times it to the, to the number of hops. And we have this uh, TC, which is the latency due to contention. So uh, you, need to, uh, you need to wait essentially sometime, you know, when, when your load is not low and your network is congested, you need to spend some time waiting. And essentially we have this load latency curve because of that. So this is the, the orange one is the ideal latency that we want. But our, uh, in reality, our latency is similar, uh, more or less like this green uh, curve. So the x-axis is injected load is a fraction of capacity. Basically, you need to define the load somehow. One way of defining is like number of fleets uh, per cycle to the network, or could be number of fleets or number of packets per cycle per node. I mean, there could be many ways of defining uh, injection load. And uh, the y-axis is actually cycle, the latency. These are also some load latency curve examples for some, uh, for different traffic patterns. These are some, so when you want to, uh, when you want to analyze the performance of your network, uh, you need to, you can actually simulate your network and then you need to uh, apply a traffic pattern on it. So the traffic can be uh, modeled by uh, from real workloads using trace, traces of them. I mean, uh, so you, you basically uh, keep the trace of uh, real workload accesses to the, to, the, to the network. And then you basically input that trace file to your network simulator and you can simulate uh, the performance, but it could be also using some synthetic traffic pattern. So these are some example of synthetic traffic pattern, like for example, uh, bit bit complement traffic is one famous, for example, traffic synthetic traffic pattern that essentially so the the destination of each node is a complement of the source address. So if your source address is, for example, in a in a eight times eight uh, mesh, if your source address is zero zero, the destination is seven seven, for example. This is a uh, the bit complement traffic pattern. Or for example, uniform random traffic, which the destination for every uh, node is uh, basically detected randomly. So it's good to show that how your network uh, is handling the traffic uniform. Uh, I mean, how can, how network distribute traffic load well? Or transpose traffic is another one, for example, that destination of X, Y is Y, X, for example. But there, remain, there are many, many other a way of, uh, or example of synthetic traffics. And each of them actually, they are trying to model some uh, important feature of traffic. So for example, bit complement is actually very famous to model the, uh, to show that how your network design is good for long traffic or global traffic pattern. So because usually by com uh, complementing the, the source, you need to go to the, the farthest, uh, destination or farthest note. So you are actually uh, checking the ability of your network for global communication. And the same, also the similar uh, cases for uniform random traffic transpose or many other uh, cases like that. So yeah, in this uh, paper, actually they also examined some topologies. Um, yeah, this is a concentrated mesh, for example. We haven't covered it, but this is essentially a mesh that uh, you concentrate. So basically this is a C mesh with C equals to four. So every four, uh, every four processors are connected to one router and those uh, routers are in, in, a, in a mesh network, for example. So, if you, for example, connect four processors, if you have a mesh network, and yet then you connect uh, four processors to every uh, to each router, then you have a C mesh network, which is uh, it's C4. It could be uh, there are some uh, variants of C mesh with C2, C8, and so on and so forth. This is a flattened butterfly, which is the implementation of butterfly in a 2D architecture. I'm not going over it. And uh, the, another one is another 
max topology, which is uh, we haven't covered also. So yeah, so if you are interested, uh, you can check this multi-drop express channels. This max topology uh, has been discussed in this paper. This is also a Kilo NOC building on MEX, like uh, Kilo NOC, a heterogeneous network on chip architecture for scalability and service guarantees. It's also quite interesting on this relative topic that how you can uh, provide a service guarantee in a, in a network on chip, like a QS enabled on the interconnect fabric for Kilo node chips, when you have thousands of nodes basically in your chip, in your network on chip. So there are many important uh, performance metrics for, uh, for network, like the packet latency, average or maximum, round trip latency, saturation throughput, what's the rate that you, you're get, your network is getting saturated, application level performance, like the execution time, which actually now it is mostly we, uh, we need that. So in the past, when you were uh, seeing papers in interconnection network, or network on chip, people were reporting uh, network level parameters like the packet latency. But uh, these days, even though we also, I mean, although we need to also report those network level latency numbers, but we should also show the some system level or higher level uh, parameters like the what's the execution time. I mean, with this better network design, how much you improve the execution time of your application, or how much you improve the job throughput. And job throughput is not necessarily network throughput. So there are many other things in, in your application that uh, affects the throughput of that. And I think uh, we are done. Any questions? We have, still have four minutes. Are there any questions on YouTube? Or... OK. So tomorrow we're going to have a lecture on simulation. Um, we will start on basically general um, um, concepts on simulation, why we need simulation, and how we can design simulators overall. But then after that, we, uh, we go into detail of uh, two important simulators. One is uh, Ramulator, with the focus on Ramulator 2, which is the state-of-the-art version of Ramulator. And uh, we also this, uh, have a tutorial on MQSIM which is a simulator for storage system that simulate modern uh, SSDs, multi-queue SSDs. So yeah, that's the plan for tomorrow and I wish to, I hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you.